Good deal. Thank you all so much. And good morning again. Walked in the door this morning. Adam Coleman took a look at me and said, it's not even Christmas. I said, I know. It's Valentine's Day this week, so I wear this so that you won't forget, guys. Don't forget. And it's Super Bowl Sunday. Both teams are red, and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. But I like cheese dip. I bet you couldn't tell, right? So today's the day. So we're going to enjoy some snacks in the game. So we are made for serving. Uh, you hear us say a lot about connect, grow, serve, and go. And, and over the next three weeks, as we build up to our volunteer uh, appreciation banquet, God has just challenged me to, to challenge you, uh, just to put on your heart and, and just to get it out there in front of you, uh, a call to service. And so really, that's, that's what we're going to be looking at over the next uh, three weeks, is that we're made to serve. That's how we're designed, it's how we're wired, it's what we are. And so we're going to look at that scripturally. Uh, and, and look at what God has to say uh, from Scripture, and, and then it becomes really personal because it comes down to this. What is your purpose? Why are you here? Have you ever contemplated that question? Have you ever studied that? Have you ever, have you ever worked through that? Uh, and how are you living out that purpose as a part of this church family? Are you a part of this church family? Uh, I'll just tell you right now, this, this message will challenge some of you. Uh, Kelly Jamison came forward at the end of the last service and said, I want to be a part of Living Faith officially. I want to be a part of this church family. I want to make that official. And so maybe that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and that may be you, this service, and it may be you over the next couple of weeks. And if it is, that's okay, because that's what God's calling you to do. I want you to do what God's calling you to do. This is not what Greg says. This is what God's calling you to do. And so if you're a visitor here today, this is your first time here, super glad that you're here, okay? And so I'm hitting you with some pretty big questions, and you're like, wait, whoa, wait a minute. And, and, and you'd you be thinking, well, those questions take some time. Yeah, you'd be right, okay? But listen, if you're a long-time attender, if you're a, if you're a member of Living Faith, then, and, and, and you're not in a particular place of service within this church, it's time to get on board, okay? Those are questions that need to be answered. And so for some of us, some of you, it's time to answer those questions. It's time to plug in. It's time to make those things happen. It's time to go. And, and as a church member, those of you that are a long-time member, how would you answer those questions? How would you describe yourself? Uh, this, is, this is how Paul described the people at the church of Ephesus. This is a challenge he gave to them thousands of years ago. still applies to us. So let's, let's look at this and read this as if this letter were coming. If I walked in this morning and said, hey, Apostle Paul wrote a letter to Living Faith. Got it here for you. I'm going to read this to you this morning. Listen and, and, and hear it that way. Hear it that way. <clears throat> as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Nothing's changed. <clears throat> All of us who also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, look at this, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Folks, <laughs> It's no different thousands of years later. It is by grace that you have been saved. All right. If you're here this morning and I ask you the question, have you been saved and baptized? And you, and you answer the question, yes, I have been saved. Then it is by grace that you have been saved. And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace. He gave a lot for us. It's expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through your faith. It is by grace that you are saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And it's not, we're going to be talking about service. We're going to be talking about works. But listen, you don't get saved by your works. You work because you're saved. That's the, that's the way you understand that. You, you, can't get, you can't get there. You don't, get, you, don't, you don't come in and say, okay, I want to go to heaven when I die. That's really important to me. So what do I need to do to get there? I want a list. Sorry, I got no list for you. Okay, Because it is by grace through faith in Christ and what He did on the cross on your behalf. That's it. That's all you have to do. And, if it, and the reason why, you can't brag about it. That's why I said, it's a, the, lest anyone could boast. We are God's handiwork. And here it is. Here, here's the meat and potatoes for today. You're created in Christ Jesus to do good things works. That's why you're here. So when I ask you that question, what's your purpose? (laughs) 
There it is. Okay, there's your answer. You were created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He has a job for you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. You're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What are you doing? What are you doing? Some of you, it's an easy answer. Some of you, it's an easy answer. <clears throat> According to the state of Kentucky, uh, five years ago, I, I got to 27 years in education, and I could have said, okay, I'm going to take what you have for me, and I'm going to go. And I didn't. It's like, mm, it's not time. Looked at it a different way. Looked at it a different way. <laughs> I had, a, had a teacher ask me this week, he said, how much longer have you got? I said, well, this is year 32. He said, what? Are you crazy? I said, no, I'm called. I don't have permission to leave yet. That's my calling. It's what I do. It's more than being a teacher. It's where I'm supposed to be. And so when you understand purpose that way, it's like, okay, I, I, I get it. I get it. A long time ago, they used to call that in psychology class when I was in high school in 1987, Donna Ford taught us that that was a self-actualized person, the top of Maslow's pyramid. She talked about Arthur Hale being that self-actualized person because he'd been there for, he, he wound up staying there for 53 years. It was his purpose. He was there when the building opened. What is your purpose? What is your plan? And here's the thing. A couple years ago, sometimes, sometimes you get tired. You get older, you get tired. And there's days that I'm like, man, I'm, I'm tired of this. I had, we had somebody come and talk to us a couple years ago, and he said something that stuck with me for a long time, and I, I try to remember this. As I get older and as it gets harder sometimes to, to do what we do every day, this is what I remember. In my, in, and this is my purpose. This is not everybody's purpose, but it's my purpose. On your worst day, this is what he said to us. On your, on your worst day, you, you very well could be the best hope one of them has. And I think about some of the kids that I have that come in front of me, and I, I, I get it. I, I don't know where all of them go home. And, 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 and so sometimes I get excited. I do. I, I, I get excited. You know, spring break's coming, fall break's coming, summer's coming. I'm counting down the days. I'm excited because I have a beautiful home and, and, and things to do. And I love to fish and love to go places, love to visit, love to travel. But sometimes when I get to those moments of breaks and the day's over, and I shut the light off in my classroom and I see the empty chairs, but I see faces, and I wonder where they are, and I wonder what they're going home to. And, and it challenges me that I may be the best hope that they have for a future, to share with them, to, to challenge them, to get them to grow, to help them in some way, more than what they learn in books. What is your purpose? What is your purpose? What is your, what is your plan that you, that you live out? You see, sometimes we hear about how we're supposed to get the most out of life. See, the danger in that is that's worldly thinking. We're going to talk about how Jesus looks and challenges that, and he goes, nah, that's how the world works, but not so with you. Okay? Because getting the most out of life is consumer mentality. If we approach church with consumer mentality, consumer church, this is, then this is what happens. How, what, what's, what is in it for me? What is in it for me? Well, what, what's in it for, for my family? What's in it for me? What am I getting out of this? How am I being fed? How am I being nurtured? How am, do you need to get fed? You need to grow. You need to have your family involved in church. So all those things. But when you look at it from, from consumer mentality, it's dangerous because who's serving? You see, who's serving? Who's stepping up? Okay? You may have noticed that I'm doing announcements now. You know why I'm doing announcements? Because somebody has to be in that chair out there to check your kids in consistently every morning. And right now, that's been one of our pastors who are supposed to be doing something else, but we need somebody to fill that chair. And so I do this. We have a purpose and a calling. Can other people do those things? Yes. Yes, you can. You see, it's a consumer mentality that becomes, that becomes it's like, well, this, what's in it for me? And if we, if we put that, see, when you turn it around, what are you doing to add to this life? What are you doing to add to this life? Paul explains in Ephesians that we're created to do good works. And, and here's the thing, when God called Jeremiah the prophet, he made it clear to him. Jeremiah 1.4 says, The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, 
Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So here's the first thing. There's four things today. First thing is this. You were created to serve God. He made you. He put you together in your mother's womb. He created you, designed you, put you in place, and He made you to serve Him. He does not exist for you. Remember that we looked at a few weeks ago when the disciples came up and said, Hey, Jesus, we have a question. Okay, what do you got? We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Cool. That's great. What do you want? Are you serious? We, we think that way. We, we may not think that way, but we act that way. We act that way. We were created to serve Him, not the other way around. We were created by Him and for Him, and we're created to serve Him. Look at this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Think about this when you do, because sometimes, you know, I, I get it. God called me to a special, very special role. I work with kids, I work with teenagers, I work with, and I'm a, I'm a pastor. But what about anything that we do? Whatever you do. Whatever you do, he says, work at it with all your heart. As if you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you, you know that you're going to be receiving inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it's the Lord Christ that you're serving. When you think about it through those lenses, when you look at it through those eyes, it changes whatever it is that you do. It's not for man. It's for Him. So we're created to serve God. Now, here's the thing. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer out loud. Just You should ponder it. Have you been saved? Are you a born-again believer? You need to know the answer to that question. Okay? If, if you're answering yes, why did he save you? You ever ask that question? Why? Why did he do what he did? Why did he go to that cross? Why did he bear the weight of your sin? Why did he shed his blood? Why did he save you? Why? Can you answer that? Listen, I'll answer it for you. <laughs> he saved you to serve Him. As simple as that. He saved you to serve Him. You were saved to serve. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Isn't that awesome? So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me as His prisoner. Rather, join me in His suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. He has saved us to serve Him. That's why. It's why. We don't serve God out of guilt. You shouldn't. If you are, it's for the wrong reason. We shouldn't serve him out of fear. You know, you shouldn't serve him out of duty. Oh, I gotta go do that. I gotta go work the door this morning because that's my duty. No, 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 no. No, that's not it. You missed it. Not guilt. Not fear. Not duty. Out of joy. <laughs> out of joy. Out of a deep gratitude of what he's done for us. You see, we're saved to serve, not to just sit around and wait for the bus to heaven. Okay? Unfortunately, <laughs> there's a lot of churches that are filled with ticket holders. Got my ticket. I'm here, waiting for the bus to heaven. All right? Come on, guys. That's not living faith. It's really not. It's not. It's not about you. It's really not about you. It's not about what you like. It's not about what you enjoy. It's not about your, 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 none of it. It's about who's not here and what we can do to get them here. It needs to be. It's not about what I like. It's not about what you like. It's about those empty seats. It's about those empty seats and who's not in them. Folks, come on. Most of this county is going to hell. That's just in Kentucky. I got a Barna research report this week, and I, I love George Barna. Sometimes what he reads makes me hurt. Okay, because God can turn anything around, don't get me wrong. Okay, I'm not saying that. But I'm just going to tell you, George Barn is usually right. And he says that young people are leaving the Christian faith in record numbers. That was the title of the article I read this week. Why? Why? 
It's because we're not doing our job. It's because not, we're not doing what we're called to do. We're saved to serve and not to sit around and wait for the bus. Listen, you're created to serve, you're saved to serve, and you're also called to serve. You say, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know about that calling stuff. I, I've heard you talk about that. Okay, I get it. Okay, I've, I was called by God to be a pastor. I've told you the story a hundred times, right? I sat down in, in Brother Armstrong's office at Beaver Dam Baptist. I called him and said, can I come talk to you? Yep. And my question to him was, how do you know you're being called to preach? And he said, the fact you're sitting there in that chair asking me the question is an indication that he's talking to you. Because, Greg, there's nobody out here waiting to ask me that question. Okay? When, when, when Brother Greg Fields said, next Sunday we're going to have Baptist Men's Day and, and, and we want somebody to come and share, I was like, oh, i got to do that. i got to go get in line so I can get my name on the list. There, there was no list. <laughs> okay? He was talking to me in that moment. See, that's call. I, I get that. And you may be like, I'm not called to preach. You don't have to be called to preach. We're all called. Okay? Here's my proof. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. We just read it. Let's read it again. Let's look at it closer. He has saved us and what? Called us. Okay? He has saved us and He has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace has given us was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. He has saved us. He has called us. He has equipped you, and He has gifted you, and He has called you. You fulfill your calling, folks. You fulfill your calling by being connected to a church family. That's how you fulfill your calling. You're, you fulfill your calling by being connected to a church family. You are a vital part of the church body. Listen, when, when any part of our physical body is not functioning, you know about it. Okay? You know anything. Man, it doesn't matter. You got, you, got, you got teeth in your head, one tooth gets an infection in it. Guess what? It's all you think about. Okay? I got a bad knee. All right? Man, when it flares up, oh, it's all I think about. It is one part, just one part. You get a you get an ingrown, infected toenail. That's nasty, isn't it? Okay, huh? Guess what? It's all you think about. Every step you take, it's like oh, okay. It only takes a little your, your little pinky toe, right? You get a cut on the end of your finger, and it's like oh, one little part of your body gets gets hurt, damaged, infected, and it takes over everything else. Your service is desperately needed in the body of Christ. Every one of us play a role. Every one of us play a role. And every role is important. Some of them are seen, and some of them are unseen. Okay? As long as you can hear me clearly this morning, everything's fine. But you let this mic start popping and snapping and speakers go, and all of a sudden Bob Barfield is the most important guy in the room. All right? You say, who's Bob Barfield? He's the guy that's got the finger on my controls. But he's unseen. And if you don't even know he's back there, then everything's working properly. Right? It's, it doesn't matter if it's an up front or in the back. It doesn't matter. Everybody has a role to play. There's no small service to God. It all matters. Listen, there's no insignificant ministries in the church. Amen. There's no such thing as an insignificant ministry. That's, that's, that's a lie. Some are visible, some are behind the scenes. But all of them, all of them are valuable. Small or hidden ministries sometimes make the biggest difference. The message begins in the parking lot, right? When you try to figure out what, which way to get in the door. Now, now it begins on the internet, right? If somebody's going to visit a church, they go to the website. It starts there. Have you ever looked at our website? You should, it's good. Do a fantastic job with it. It's really cool. All of those things are significant. All of those things are important. Somebody has to manage that. Somebody has to make that. Do you even know who does? Corey Marshawn does a great job making our, our website look great. Y'all may not even know. He works with that. Josh Corley is the one who set it up years ago, made it look really cool, and Corey made it better. All of those things matter. All of those things matter immensely to the church. It's all part of what we do. 
You don't have the option to not serve and just be fed. It's not an option. What happens if your kidneys say, you know what? I'm tired of all this blood filtering. I'm just going to sit here and just do nothing. I'm just going to just hang out. I'll tell you. I'll answer for you. (laughs) You'll die pretty quickly. All right? Get incredibly sick and eventually the body will not be able to function. It's vital. It's vital. The body of Christ works that way. All parts matter, no matter how small or insignificant, and and everything has a purpose and a plan. When parts of the body have decided they don't want to do what they're created to do and what they're called to do, then the body of Christ suffers. It suffers. When you, have an, when you have a gift and you have an ability and you have a talent and you have consciously said, I just, I'm just not going to do that. I'm just not going to use it. I'm not going to go out there. I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm not going to take the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend more time for me and less time. Ooh, careful. Be real careful with that. Okay? Be real careful with that. You'll have a hard time working through that after hearing this. I promise you. You were created to serve. You were saved to serve. You were called to serve. But it goes further. Okay? It goes further. And this is not from me. This is from him. You're commanded to serve. Okay? If, that, if the rest of it doesn't get you, <laughs> then, then the last one does. You are commanded by God to serve. It, it, there's not an option. Okay, there's not an option. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, is the end of a, of a conversation that he has with his disciples. And he says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Look, this is how this works. It, is, there was a conversation, it's kind of similar to what we talked about a few weeks ago, when two of them came and said, Hey, we want you to do whatever we ask. Oh, okay, cool, what do you want? Well, we want to be great. We want the upfront seats. We want the visible seats. We want the cool seats. We want the, pre- we want the box. We want the big box. We want to be up there. Oh. And then he looks at him and says, let me, let me explain something to you. You know how the world works, right? Right? You know how the world works. You have laborers and you have all these people and then you have your CEO, right? You have the top of the chain, right? Well, I'm sorry, he says, not so with you. It's upside down. Jesus was a servant. And everything that he did, everything that he did, he fed people, he healed people. He worked tirelessly. He didn't own a house. He didn't, have, he, didn't have, he didn't even have his own boat. He didn't have anything. He washed their feet at the end just so he could help them understand this is what this is about, guys. This is what this is about. It's about service. We don't have an option. He didn't give us an option. We have to act on what we know and practice what we claim to believe. I heard a pastor once say that impression without expression causes depression. Do you get that? Impression without expression causes depression. You've got to do something. Study without service leads to spiritual stagnation. Listen, it's, uh, Bible studies are great. <laughs> okay? Small groups are vital. It's part of what we do. Connect and grow. But then you've got to go do something. You just don't keep growing. When you get to heaven someday, it's not going to look like this. It's not going to be... He's not going to look at you and say, You are so smart. <laughs> man, you studied the Bible more than anybody I know. Come on in here, man. That's all. You know just about... No, let me tell you. When you get there, it's going to be like, Wow, that was very different than anything. I... So, so look, if you've got the basics, all right, you're good to go. Let's get to work. You can study all you want, and I'm not knocking it at all. You need to read it cover to cover. You need to be in groups. You need to discuss it. You need to do all those things. But in addition to, (laughs) you've got a place to serve. Because this is more like the question that's going to be asked on that day of judgment is, how many did you get? How many seats did you fill? How many did you share the gospel with? How many people that, that, how many did you rescue from hell? How many did you change their life? Taylor got back from Turkey a couple of weeks ago. I think about the places that she's been and, and, and the things that she's done. And a few years ago, it's been several years ago, she went into India 
We couldn't share where she was going when she went because India can be dangerous. And I remember giving her a Bible when she went there uh, to share, to give to someone. And I'll just tell you, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel the weight of where she was at and, and the risk that she was in. And, and of course, she was in, she's a student, and, and it's a little different in that situation. And so it's not that she was under that, uh, that much. But, but I was reading something this week, and, and it dawned on me, and I, I, I copied it, and uh, I, sent it, I sent it to her uh, about a, a, a resident of, of India. His name is uh, Vijay. Vijay is an elder of a church in Madhya Pradesh state. He left Hinduism, which is the religion of that country. And that's why we can't go in to say we're here to share the gospel. He left Hinduism to follow Christ after being healed of tuberculosis. And his faith in Jesus Christ meant everything to him. And he knew he had to share his faith with others despite the risk that he was taking. And you ask, what risk is that? Well, Vijay led his wife, many of his relatives to the Lord. He didn't stop there. He boldly shared the gospel with local villagers, and eventually more than 30 Hindu families placed their faith in Christ. As the gospel spread, so did word of Vijay's evangelistic pursuits. And one afternoon, while his wife and children were away, Vijay lay down to take a nap after a long morning of working with his cows, and he awoke to find his home engulfed in flames. A group of Hindu extremists had set his house on fire and fled the scene. Their hope was to kill him and silence his gospel witness. The fire destroyed his house. It killed several of his buffalo, his goats, and cows that his family depended on for their livelihood. But he got away. He managed to escape. This is what he had to say. When he reflected on the incident, he quoted Job chapter 1, verse 21, and said, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And though his face and his hands were scarred by the flames, he remains joyful. And he says, if I'm alive or dead, it will be for Jesus only. And I think about that Bible that I gave Taylor when she went there. And I told her when she went there, I said, find the right person to share this with. And I never really thought about it until now, the risk that that person would be taking to follow Christ. That she sat every day that she was there with this young lady in a library, and she, and she shared with her the gospel, and then she gave her that Bible to take with her. And, 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 and so when you do things like that, God takes it, and, and, and then He just does what He does with it. Listen, <laughs> we don't get it here. We just don't. We've got it too easy. And what happens is that study, we spend so much time studying, but if study without service leads to that spiritual stagnation. It's like the Sea of Galilee is a, is a, is a flowing uh, body of water, and water flows in and water flows out, and so it's a body that's alive, it has fish, it, it provides food, it provides transportation and everything. But the Dead Sea is different. Water only fl- flows in. So if, if it's your plan to just come and let somebody pour into you and you don't pour out you'll you stagnate or you sit soaking sour and nobody wants that either listen (laughs) i'm glad you're here today but if the only thing that you're doing is going to church it's not enough it's not enough okay most christians already know far more than what they're putting into practice (laughs) All right? I'm, I'm being serious. And you're like, well, you know what? Yeah, forget that. Most Christians already know more about the Bible than they're even coming close to putting into practice. If, if, if it were, our, our buildings would be full. Because we're not witnessing. We're not inviting. We're not doing the work. It's not my job to go and get everybody. Okay? It doesn't work that way. It comes to an end of itself. I can only talk to so many people. I can only disciple so many people. And so an old pastor told me once, he said, you, you keep them the way you get them. If you're the one that gets them, then you're the one that has to keep them. But listen, when you, when the body, when the body witnesses, when the body invites, when the body disciples, it multiplies. And that's the way it's designed to do. That's the way it was always designed. Jesus didn't come to get them all. He got 12. Gave them the plan. 
And there was no plan B. And that's the way it works. Listen. Most of the time, we're more interested in serve us than service. So my challenge for you this week is take a little time. Take some time and think about it. Take some time and think about it. I, I've, I've created some seeds, maybe stepped on a toe or two. That's okay. I'm aiming for your heart. Take some time and ponder. We're created to serve. We're saved to serve. We're called to serve. And we're commanded to serve. So where are you going to serve? Where are you going to serve? Ask him. He'll show you. I promise you. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you called us. We thank you that you you made us, that you saved us, and that you want us to partner with you. Father, sometimes we just need to be um, encouraged a little bit. Sometimes we need to be kicked a little harder. You're pretty good at it. Father, whatever it is that we need to do, show us. However we need to respond to this, show us. Father, we just take this time of invitation and reflection just to lift your uh, name up and, and, and just invite your spirit in. And Father, maybe there is somebody that's here that's never said yes to that relationship that you offer. And, and you are calling them personally. And they need to respond now personally. Father, you know what we need to do. We're going to put this time and and we're going to just dedicate it to you, Lord. We pray it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.